Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Most likely their second time to the temple because prayer time was at 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and sunset. Now, if they're going to the temple, who might they encounter outside and inside the temple? Do you know? Lame man, beggars, and people. There's going to be Gentiles, most likely in the outer court, if there's any there. Then they'll go past the women, and then they'll go closer to the place where they worship and have their prayer. So there's people at the temple, but on their way in, they see a man. Verse 2. Now a man who was lame from birth. Anybody have the King James Version or the New King James Version? That's okay. Either one works. What does verse 2 say, Betty? Right. But I only read the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight words. And I want you to read the first eight or nine words of Acts chapter 3, verse 2. Okay. And the third man, lame from his mother's womb, what? was carried. Before he was even born. Right. Lame from his mother's womb. Thank you, Betty. Yep. This guy never knew what it was like to stand on his own two feet. A man, NIV says, who was lame from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. And remember, we talk about how there's the Gentile courts, the court for the ladies, and the other courts. Verse 3. When, Peter, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. All right. What was Peter? Fisherman. Probably didn't have a lot of money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. I kind of have a feeling, and this is speculation, it's not anything in the Bible, but can you imagine nearly every day of your life? Asking the same people who went by for money. Pretty soon you probably don't look them in the eye anymore. It's kind of a shameful thing. And the scripture tells us that Peter and John looked at this dude. And Peter said, look at us. With an exclamation point. So he had to get his attention. Look at us. I don't think he said it in a mean way, but to get the attention, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. Told you he's a fisherman. But what I do have... I give you. We're going to start a new list. 
because we're talking about evidence and examples of transforming discipleship. So far, we've learned two things about disciples. Well, we know Peter's a disciple, John's a disciple. We know they did what? Well, they went to the temple to do what at 3 p.m.? I like this one better. <laughs> Disciples pray. What else? Disciples know what they have. In this case, Peter started by saying, silver or gold, I do not have. <laughs> but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up. And instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. A guy who had never used his legs before. A guy who everyone who's already in the temple courts has passed if they came through the gate called Beautiful. And they'd seen him every day begging. And who did we say was in the temple? People. Gentiles on the outside, women after that, then the others. There's witnesses, witnesses to an amazing miracle. Amazing seems to be the word that comes up a lot in the book of Acts. Keep reading, you'll see. Verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. Do you know of any toddler who ever just jumped to their feet and started walking? This guy jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to them. Stuff like that just seems to be around Peter and John and the disciples. Look across the page backwards or maybe turn backwards to Acts chapter 2. Remember the Holy Spirit came. The disciples are speaking in languages that are not their own. Verse 7 of chapter 2 says, Utterly amazed, they... Those who heard their own language said, Are not these men who are speaking Galileans? Again, a miracle. <laughs> because they were uneducated, but they're speaking all these different languages. That kind of miracle induces amazement. <laughs> Again, look in verse 12. What's the crowd say? Or what does the author Luke say about the crowd amazed and perplexed then go back to chapter 3 everyone who saw this man recognized this guy who was lame jumping and praising God now they are filled with wonder and amazement 
think, you think Peter's got their attention? I think it's more God got their attention than Peter. But verse 11 goes like this. While the man held on to Peter and John, and we don't know why he held on. Maybe he was nervous standing for the first time. Maybe he was so grateful we just, I don't know, when think good things happen, we shake hands, high five, fist bump. We used to hug before COVID. Right hand. Where do you see it's the right hand? Oh, right hand, fist bump? Yeah. Oh, where's that? Verse 7, okay, yep. Taking him by the right hand. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, it talks about the mighty arm, the mighty right arm of the Lord. Sorry, lefties. Verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, amazed and astonished, and came running to them, in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, what did Peter do? Saw this. Saw what? The people were amazed and astonished. He saw the moment. So disciples pray, know what they have. There's power in the name of Jesus, isn't there? And they recognize the moment. People are astonished, amazed, and Peter has an audience. So what does he do? He's about to tell them about Jesus. And he knows his audience. How do we know that? Well, he says to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if, he used that teenager language back then, as if. Why do you stare at us as if, by our own power and godliness, we had made this man walk? There's something else there, isn't there? That's it. It's not our power. Give credit where credit is due. When Peter saw this, verse 12, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, told you he knew his audience, because that's the language when you talk to Jews. They always talked about the God of their Father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he really lays it on them. <laughs> Has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One, and ask that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. You might think, why is he so accusatory? They might just 
tune him out, turn their backs, go somewhere else. Remember, it's not him who's speaking, right? Well, wait, he might be speaking, but who's speaking through him? Amen. Verse 16. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. <laughs> there is no denying, was there? He's jumping. Praising God. And Peter says it again. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through Him that has completely healed Him. As you all can see. There's the answer. The explanation to the astonishing, amazing Miracle that they're all witnessing right now, right there, right then. Verse 17. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. So he made all those accusations earlier, which were all spot on and true. Factual accusations. And then he says, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. Anyone here ever heard of Michael Jr.? Michael Jr. is a Christian comedian. And maybe tonight before you go to bed, Google Michael Jr. Or... Go on YouTube and watch some of his stuff. He's funny. He's very funny. One, one of my favorite jokes that Michael Jr. tells is he makes jokes about people being oversaved. Like if you don't use a comforter on your bed because you have the Holy Spirit, you're oversaved. Anyway. He talks about how his daughter came up to him crying, upset. Daddy, daddy, my brother called me a name. He called me something. I said, settle down, honey. What what would your brother call you? He called me ignorant. He said, well, sweetheart, do you know what that means? She said, no. He said, well, you ignorant. <laughs> yeah. Ignorant. You don't know what you don't know. And let me tell you what the Lord's been putting on my heart lately. And I've mentioned a time or two in Sunday morning, but just for further consideration, and just to maybe the Spirit will speak to you about it too. But you hear people talk about, we need revival. We need revival. We, we need revival. But what does revival kind of imply? That something was dead, right? Right. Right. So, revival has got to come to something dead to make it alive again. What I think people need more than anything outside of the church is an awakening. And the church needs a revival. That, that, that scripture that people quote all the time, 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, if my people who are called by my name. That's what he says before revival is poured out. So it starts with us. It starts with the church. Holy, fully devoted to him. And we pray that he would soften and awaken the hearts of those who are still spiritually dead.
Because they, the world doesn't know they're evil. They just know what they know. It's their nature. And it doesn't do us much good as Christians to say, you're evil. Yeah, we know it's evil, but that's just going to make enemies. And we start calling people names or tell them what they do wrong. That's not the best way to share the good news. We pray for spiritual awakening. Pray for God to soften the hearts. Be careful of making enemies because who is our enemy? Not people who think differently than us, sin differently than us. The devil's the enemy. Satan's the enemy. And the thing he would love to do is make us pick fights with people who are made in the image of God and have us be enemies. Spiritual awakening or revival is not going to happen then. I'm not saying we don't call sin, sin. But what I am saying is we got to see the sinner through the eyes of Jesus. Sorry, I got off on a tangent. The point I was making is those people who are living in sin are ignorant. To them, it's just natural. They do what feels good. Exactly. Yep. And you probably can't hear on YouTube, but Joyce pointed out that it's either in First or Second Corinthians that the godly wisdom is foolishness to those people. Verse 17, let me get back on track. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that our times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now this, if you look at it really close, it really doesn't seem to make sense at first. Because what does it mean to repent? To turn from? So if you read verse 19, repent, to turn from, then turn to God. So actually, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It's not two turns in a row. It's a turn from to turn to. I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> Repent. The change of mind that results in a change of action. That's good. I don't think I said that, but it's good. <laughs> Be converted. Yeah. We can add on to that, Joyce, change of mind and heart and the change of action. But that's really what I want us to note there. Repent. The turn from sin and the turning to God. Turn from sin, turn to God. The conversion. Because he's the only one who can mm -hmm. cleanse away our sins. And uh, yeah, so that our sins may be wiped out. Mm -hmm. And the times of refreshing may come. Think about it. When things are clean, how refreshing that is. I like having clean sheets on the bed. I like smelling laundry when I carry it out of the dryer. We smell much better after a shower, don't we? <laughs> Especially after the girls are done with volleyball. <laughs> Repent. 
repent. So you see, what the Holy Spirit was doing through Peter when Peter was preaching earlier, yeah, he was working on their hearts. I hope they felt guilty for what they did to the Son of God. How they handed him over to be killed. How they disowned him. (laughs) Twice he told the, the people there they disowned him. They asked for a murderer to be released. Killed the author of life. The Holy Spirit was working on their souls. Guilt. So they would turn from what they'd done and turn to God because there's forgiveness. And really, Paul goes on to say, of course, Luke wrote Acts, but Paul says what in Romans 3.23. Go there, just for fun. It's only 34 pages in my Bible. You can find it quick. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. There's no difference from us and those Israelites. Verse 23. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, verse 24, are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. We do fall short. And only then and through Him do we measure up. Because of Him. All because of Jesus. Verse 19 of Acts chapter 3. Repent then and turn to God. Turn from sin, turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing or as Elaine pointed out, cleansing may come from the Lord. Who does it come from? Not of ourselves. Another great illustration I heard for evangelistic purposes. A preacher I used to like to listen to, he, he'd often have to fly on a plane. And uh, there were times when he just wanted to sleep, not talk to anybody, but then the Holy Spirit would say, you need to talk to this person. <laughs> and so, the, you know, the conversation might start about the weather or what do you do for a living? That's often how this preacher would start the conversation. And the guy's, I'm a businessman. I'm, or the lady might say, you know, I'm a businesswoman just <laughs> flying back to Chicago. And then inevitably, they'd ask him, well, what do you do? And he'd say, I'm a preacher. <laughs> Oftentimes, that'd be the end of the conversation. Other times, there'd be conversations, oh, you know, I go to church Easter and Christmas, or, you know, I tried that God stuff and it didn't work out. And he'd pray for an open door where he could share about the line. And he'd have, have them draw a line on their napkin. I know Southwest, sometimes other airlines will give you a napkin with the snacks, draw a line, and write God at the top of that line, and... What can you do to get there? But before he had him write down what to do, he said, now, I want you to write down at the bottom, you know, where we are, down here, where we are, up here's God. And then I want you to put somewhere in between where we are and where God is, Billy Graham. Okay, I'll put Billy Graham here. You know, just a little under God. And, and other 
famous preachers or pastors or people from history. And he would explain how no matter what any of us do, that line, we could never get above. We just keep hitting it because there's nothing on our own to get us through there. And then he would draw a line with Jesus busting through, explaining that's how Jesus, that's what he does for us. Where there seemed to be no way, Jesus made a way by dying on the cross for us. So... Repent then, verse 19 of Acts chapter 3. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that He may send the Messiah who is appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive Him until a time comes from God to restore everything, as He promised long ago through His holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel and all the prophets who have spoken, and they have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he raised him up from the grave. He sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Again, by the power of the Holy Spirit, a masterful message from Peter. He appealed to their culture, their heritage. He revealed to them their guilt. He gave them the opportunity and showed them the need to turn from their sin and turn to God. And then he talked about how God would restore all things because where's Jesus now? He's in heaven until he comes back. That's one thing we don't hear much in church anymore, do we? That was something they always thought about back in Peter and John's day. They were really, really, really looking forward to it. They weren't looking forward to going to heaven. They were looking forward to Jesus coming back. They talked about that more than them going to heaven. Because Jesus is going to come back and restore everything, make everything right. Yeah. Right. It's really the only hope we have, too. So, that's chapter 3. But what did we learn from chapter 3 before we go to that? Lynn? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about praying, pray big. <laughs> right. And sometimes when your prayer isn't answered the way that you expect it, it might be for a good reason. There's a lot of people who turn away from the church because they feel their prayers aren't answered. Well, neither was this beggar, so look what happened to him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was better than what his prayers were expected. And I just think that you have to be in there for the long haul sometimes. And he was up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Well, hey, every day having to be carried to the temple, that was a long haul. Amen. Later, some perspective on it, she was giving so much more 
So on YouTube, just in case you couldn't hear Lynn, it was an excellent insight that sometimes we ask for things like the beggar did, silver or gold. And we don't get it, but God has something so much better for us than we would ever want for ourselves or have in mind for ourselves. And it's the perseverance in prayer. Sometimes it's a long haul and we may not get what we want, but we can trust He'll bless us more than we'd ever expect. And we might be astonished and amazed. And others around us might be astonished and amazed. Like the little girl in the hospital with a bad heart. Who gained a family. And He does. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, it helps develop that spiritual maturity to not easy though. No, it's not. Some things you're wondering, you know, all those advances, like, we thought it should have been. But it's in his plan, not in our plan. Amen. We're selfish a lot. <laughs> we're, we're selfish a lot. <laughs> Even though we died to self, yes, we are. <laughs> we're still selfish a lot. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah. Right. Look what he did. <laughs> yeah. Right. Can you imagine how they had to feel like he had to call them out, but at the same time, they're here and they're not And what he did. <laughs> but it also helps you think that he must have really knew how Jesus forgave him. And if Jesus forgave him what he did, he could forgive himself and just keep. You know, he was free to say what he had to say. Yeah. It had to be, it had to be real, huh? <laughs> that intent, intense faith. He redeemed himself. From all the times he denied Christ. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in the courts, he redeemed himself. He was a totally different person getting up there and saying, you know. Yeah. And he would say, it wasn't me. He redeemed myself. It was what the Spirit could do with him when he just gave himself over. Yeah. And the Lord did redeem everything, didn't he? And he'll do the same for us. But it's hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, there is. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm calling you out. Yeah. But the reason I'm calling you out was because I'm trying to bring you to Christ. Because God loves you. Right. Yeah. Well, and not me. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But God's working through you to 
Exactly. Right. And he, yeah, and how, but how about the grace in that? Right at the end, a reminder that you're the Israelites. You're still God's chosen people, the first. Yeah. Yeah. And he had to turn too, didn't he? Yeah, to, to your point, Carol, he had to make the choice to come back. Like 60 days, two months. Yeah. Maybe three months. No. At the same time of day, just about that he'd betrayed him. Yeah. Because Jesus knew what he was doing when he called him the rock, huh? Yeah. Any other thoughts? Anything stand out as we were going through that? Thank you for speaking up and having the courage. Lord, we do thank you for your word and we thank you for your perfect plan. We thank you that we can trust you. We know that all your ways are higher than ours and your th thoughts are higher than ours. And, and Lord, help us in our faith. Help us. Help us to pray. Lord, help us to continue to serve you with humility and give credit where credit is due. And Lord, help us to know when's the right time to say what you want us to say or do what you want us to do. And, and Lord, I thank you for just how you work all things together for the good of those who are loved and called according to your purpose. And help us, Lord, as we continue to, uh, to follow you in the good times and the times that are not so good. Lord, thank you for your love for this world and help us to love others well. And Lord, bless the rest of this evening and, and uh, may you just give everyone and their families a great rest of the week. And we look forward to being in your house together to worship you on Sunday. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.